never going to muster up the call. It doesn't matter how long they're going to sit there. They know they're going to fold. They just also like their hand. They don't want to fold. They just need that, like, push to, hey, just toss it in, buddy. We know you're going to fold. Um, I, I really like to see – I know there's, I'm sure, not statistics out there, but, you know, when the clock is called on players, how often they call versus how often they fold. Because I think it's, like, drastically – like probably like nine to one in favor of do they they fold, they fold in the early all the time. Do you agree? Just disagree. Middle pair here. With no, I, I agree with that. I I do think that this table would have gone a decent amount slower had, um, if there wasn't a timer. I think maybe uh, ten percent, ten to fifteen percent slower. And what what types of scenarios? Just uh, I think Joe would have taken more time before shoving the ace jack. Um, he probably would have arrived at the same conclusion, but I think he would have been more, much more deliberate in his, in his thinking and in his actions. Um, I think that Joe would have t also taken more time in the entire nine nine hand, choosing yeah. whether to five bet shove pre flop versus flat, and and choosing to, to fold that flop. Sure, sure. We got Eric checking the flop here and then raising the turn with queen nine high. Let's we'll uh, see if Justin can muster up Justin a is, uh, light call is down. in position, right? Uh, Eric is in position, yes. Uh, oh, Eric is in position. Okay. Flop on check, check. Justin led the turn. Sure, Eric sure, sure. I suspect Justin is not going to believe him here. This line not particularly credible. Eric looks a little uncomfortable there. Yeah. Oh, well, well, look at that. Wow. First. That's going to make him a little more comfortable. Justin but you can see Justin's reaction to that one. He, he kept a pretty good face on it. Frustrating spot there for Justin, correctly calling the turn way ahead and then Eric hitting his uh, six outer with his bluff there. Now it's anybody's game. 58 to 66 big blinds. I think we may have seen uh, Zach really take his time with a 10 5 on the river against Eric when Eric had a straight. Sure. Sure. So I, I, I really like the the time the clock uh, in general. I mean, it obviously, coming from an online background, it's always existed online. Yeah, exactly. Um, and it, it, I think it just makes sense uh, that, you know, it's, it's not good to reward uh, players who may be inconsiderate of other people's, uh, you know, time. And um, some people you know, deliberately use time in order to get an unfair advantage or to um, tilt their opponents or just to kind of enjoy their time in the in the limelight or in the spotlight, which uh, none of which are, are productive or helpful to the to the game of poker. It just makes it a frustrating game to play, too, when you're just sitting there waiting for someone every single hand. Right. Specifically in, in getting an advantage and... Especially in, in like satellites, for example, or you know, on the bubble of a tournament. Well, that's why I like the action clock because there are still players that are going to take their time, and, and we've seen it. I, I saw it at near the bubble, uh, five diamonds in Vegas. There were players that were short on the bubble and were taking their full thirty seconds every time before they folded. But I think the benefit to the action clock still is that it's now fair. You don't have a table where people say, hey, buddy, don't worry about it. We know you're short. Just sit there and take as much time as you want, you know, and we won't call clock on you. That's really unfair to other tables that people are getting the clock called on them. Um, you know, so I think that the action clock just kind of evens the playing field. If people want to use their full 30 seconds, that's up to them. They may have tough decisions. They may be trying to make the money, but they're going to get a set amount of time, and then their hand is going to be folded. That's going to be it. Um, so it really evens everything out there, which, which I like. There's yeah, been it sort a of solves the collective action problem, right? Because if you're a short stack and all the other short stacks are tanking every hand, you'd be a sucker not to do it. Exactly. So that kind of eliminating that aspect of it and just making, like you're saying, making sure everyone's on an even playing field. Exactly. really nice in that regard. There's been a little bit of the debate over the 
allotment of the time chips. I believe you start with four, and then when you hit 27 player or 24 players, you get six. It goes up to it. You re, you know refills your uh, to six, and then at the final table you get eight. Um, some players have suggested carrying over unused chips and getting additional chips. What, what do you think about that? Do you, do you like the way it's allotted now? I don't have an issue with that. Like I, I mentioned earlier, I think that eight is excessive for the final table, um, at least so far. The players are going to be playing less hands at the final table than they did to get from the bubble down to 24 players. Sure. They're sure. also playing fewer hands at the final table than to get from 24 down to six. So, um, I don't know. I, I ran out of time trips pretty quickly uh, going from the bubble down to 24 players. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I think that, well, I think that one of the big issues too is that field size varies so much. You know, so in a lot of smaller WPT events where maybe 45 or 54 people cash, you know, four time chips from 50 down to 27 does not seem so bad. But in an event like here at Borgata where, what, 100 and, how many people players cashed? 154? 156. 156. Uh, 156 down to 24 is, that's a that's a large difference. So yeah. um, I'd like to see a little bit of adjustment there for the future. But this is the first season. Uh, I think that, you know, WPT's done a great job bringing the clock into the main spotlight here and, you know, into a, a major tour like this. So it's uh, it's great to see. I'm excited to see where it goes in the future. Well, I'll, yeah, I, I had an additional issue with the uh, with the shot clock, uh, which was that um, I, I was originally informed that we'd be getting four chips uh, that day, and then at the end of the day, we'd be getting six chips the following day. Now, what ended up happening is the end of the day ended, we bagged at whatever, 2 a.m., uh, but it wasn't yet down to 24 players. So the day had ended, and I was planning on getting a, a six new chips. They but were then, but planning then I w- on playing the 24. Right, right? exactly. Yeah. But then I was informed, no, 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 we we got to wait, and uh, you can't get your chips until you play to 24. So I basically was just uh, verbalizing all of my bets in order to save time of needing to carve sure. out chips and, sure. and whatnot. I always recommend players use more verbalization when they bet. Uh, especially if you're a newer player and you're kind of not sure, you know, what you want to do in the hand or, or not what you want to do, but like, you know, let's say you're trying to raise, you're not quite sure the exact chip to put out. Um, you want to bet, you know, 550 and you only have a 1000 chip. Like just use your words first. If you use your words first, it's much easier for the dealer to help you out, for other players to help you out, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, I constantly see players like struggling to call and like kind of finding the right chips. Like, just say the word call. If you say the word call, everyone knows what you're doing. The dealer will say, okay, put in this chip or the player next to you might help you out. You know, um, it just makes it much easier on everyone. Verbalizing is good. and verbal Both players are trash here. Exactly. Eric not immediately folding. Though. And there it is. Still an even heads up match. Yeah, Eric got off to a pretty hot start here. But uh, yeah, we were quite deep with both players around 60 big ones. This could uh, take a while or it could be over next hand. Of the uh, four players at this final table who have been eliminated, who do you think is the most tilted with the results? Who do you think is the most pleased with their play today? Mm, that's a good question. I would have to say that I'm gonna go. I'm gonna th- say Mike Martyr is probably the most pleased. Uh, he got his largest cash. He managed to get uh, one pay jump despite being one of the shortest stacks coming in. He played very well. He got coolered once or twice. Definitely once, arguably twice. He got a little lucky to be in and unlucky to be out. You know, I, there wasn't much he could have done differently. So I, I think that for somebody like him, that this was a nice experience overall. For the player who's most tilted, it's probably pretty close between Zach, the chip leader, who's out in third. But I'm going to say it's got to be Joe. It's always going to be Joe because Joe just takes these things the hardest always. When he doesn't wow. win. He feels like he should always win. Um, and he's got probably got a whole lot to complain about based on the way this experience went. Yeah, I was going to say, I think Steven is the is probably the most uh, tilted, co- being the commanding chip leader with 10 players left and then sure. taking six, especially in the fashion 
that he did lim limping where he didn't necessarily have to, but where it kind of made sense in the cutoff with Ace Deuce yeah. suited. I think even if he raises that hand, he's still going to wind up in the same spot. I don't think Eric's going to fold threes. Oh, sure. And Eric with a pair of threes now. Going to try to value bet the river. For 800,000. Nice Justin with just Eric. ace high. Yeah, definitely. Did uh, Eric see about the Ace high's got to be tempting to bluff catch with. You don't have to be good that often. Did Eric see about the flop? Did you see? I sure. believe so, but I'm not. If Eric's about the flop, I, I don't hate maybe using this as a check raise on the river here as Justin. Yeah, he bet 600 on the flop and Justin called. Justin calls. We'll get the bad news. And for the first time at this final table, Eric Afriot is our chip leader. Very nice comeback for him. I mean, he's been swinging all over the place this whole final table, and now he's just... Chip leader heads up, put himself in a nice spot. The real estate Lots investor. Of World Poker Tour experience for Eric. Yeah, the real estate Fifth investor. Fifth final table career. Won a WPT at Seminole Hard Rock. In a past life, he was an art dealer. <laughs> Perhaps a future life. <laughs> Justin with ace king. Eric with king 10, a nice hand, but probably not a three betting hand. Being told they're having some issues with the table audio, so just have us for now. I would split three yeah, betting. I saw them talking to each other for a while and I was wondering what was going on, but with the king we 10. are in the dark on that one. Eric flops a 10. Justin with the backdoor nut flush draw. I think at this stack depth especially, I, I vastly prefer calling with, with King-10 here, pre-flop. I wouldn't mind a raise now oh, from, yeah. from Eric. Sure. And he does. Eric's going to check-raise the flop here. I think uh, Justin's only play is to call the Ace-King with the Ace of Clubs here. Yeah, it seems like a pretty clear call. He's got a lot of, lot of potential. Fortunately for Justin, only three of his outs are live. But he does have a couple of backdoors to go with it. Yeah, a king on the turn would be would be just just terrible for Justin here. But he definitely could think his ace king is the best hand. He's looking at that backdoor nut flush draw, two different backdoor straight draws possible. He does continue. Three point five million chips in the pot. Turn is a six. No help for Justin. And Eric is going to keep betting. This is also a card that's going to complete a lot of Eric's uh, draws. His 5-4 got there. His 6-5, uh, 6-4 made a pair if he has those hands. Justin does let it go. Yeah, good fold on the turn there by Justin. Eric showed the king. Interesting show. That's that's actually like a really bad card for Justin to see because it's like, you know, he's ahead of almost every king that Eric could have there, but King Ten is the hand that Eric actually had. So, twenty million chips now for Eric. Continual climb as this heads up match has started. Justin far from out though. Justin's still in good shape. Yeah, he came in quite short today. He was a short stack for most of the final table. I mean. He's played his big stack well, but he can certainly recover here. Quite deep stacks. Eric with the jack six suited. He's going to keep raising to his bigger sizing. 950 that time. That is a large sizing indeed. Justin will fold the 6-4. Some love in the chat for Canada. Eric from Montreal. Canada represents, as Matt C. in the YouTube chat. 
Where are the Florida fans? Where's 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 Justin's crew? Let's hear from them as well. Eric is running quite well this heads up YouTube chat a lot of discussion you know it, it's not only one of the things about heads up is not only making big hands and making strong hands I mean we saw Justin get dealt four very premium hands to start the heads up but it's what's going on on the other side of the table what does your opponent have and what's been happening with Eric is that Eric seems to keep barely notching Justin you know Justin has ace king Eric is king 10 he flops a 10. Uh, Justin has a seven, Eric is ace three, Eric flops a three, and then gets some value post swap. You know, it's it's situations like that where not only do you make a hand, but your opponent makes a slightly worse hand that can call a bet that really hurts you heads up. Yeah, that's definitely a good point. See, so a good example here, Justin has queens, yeah, but go. he gets a walk, so it doesn't yeah. really help him much. He does look and see. Justin visually frustrated just with the way this match is going so far. It has been a long tournament for both of these guys, outlasting 1,200 people. And the blinds are going up now to 200,000 and 400,000. Yeah, at the end of a marathon final table like this, it's easy to sort of let the mask slip a little bit, especially in between hands and heads up when the hands are coming so fast. Now with the blinds increasing. Eric's still with 53 big blinds and the 40 big blinds of Justin Zaki. What's that, Kane? Uh, yeah, I was just going to comment. With the blinds increasing, Justin is back down to 40 big blinds. And now he's picking up eight deuce offsuit on his button. He will fold. There's been a decent amount of button folding um, some of it good, but uh, a lot of it we earlier saw Eric fold, I believe, uh, jack three on his button. That's probably a, a playable hand. And we just saw Justin a few hands ago fold 10-5 offsuit, which is a playable hand, especially with antis. Yeah, agreed. I think I think those type of hands you have to play heads up. I mean, it's hard. You know, you're sitting there across and someone you're like, do I really want to enter this pot with, you know, 10-3? But the bottom line is there's only two players in the hand. You know, you have a certain percent against your opponent. There's a lot of money in the pot already. You just can't fold very much in that spot. What's interesting is we saw this heads-up match start by Eric limping the button with deuce four offsuit, um, and we since have have seen him fold hands that are stronger than that, such as jack three offsuit in a small blind. I think people often Eric with king ten suited a pretty nice hand here. Connectedness over high card raggedness, it's, it's pretty common, especially especially heads up. People want to make that wheel with four two, and they don't factor in there. Uh, you know, the, the ability to make pairs have being so weak with 4-2. So Eric min-raising this hand, but that might be just because the blinds just went up. Justin with a pretty obvious call with King-3. Justin is out in front, but Eric has some nice draws to go with his hand. He's got a gut shot and a backdoor flush draw. Eric with his customary small C bet. This could be another frustrating one for Justin if he has to call the flop and fold the future street. All These right. types of spots are annoying. You can feel like you're just sort of bleeding to death. But... Justin's fans making some noise in the chat now. Here they come. They're going to be a fan of that Three card. On the turn. That is a good card for Justin. And now we'll see how crazy Eric wants to get. Not that crazy, it seems. And now both players have missed. Justin likely going to try to bet for value. It's going to be hard for Eric to call here, though. One point two from Justin. Quick wow! Call does make from the call. With King he high. does make the call with King High. Justin takes down a big one. 
it's hard to call with a hand like that. I could see the call with ace high because then you beat all the busted straight draws. But when you have a king and a 10 in your hand, you block a lot of Justin's bluffs there, I think. Yeah, that's absolutely true. And of course, you lose to king queen. Yeah, so having a hand like ace, ace x, you know, ace two or something, I think is a much better bluff catcher there than king 10. But also, the other issue with making that call there is Justin's value range is actually pretty wide. He, of course, is going to value bet all threes, value bet all jacks, and probably value bet all nines. Or most nines. I don't know nines. about all nines, but I yeah. think he value bets some of the better nines. Maybe nine, ten plus. Dead even here at the WPT Borgata Winter Poker Open. Playing for over $200,000 difference. Six hundred and thirty-six thousand dollars to the winner, plus that fifteen thousand dollar tournament champion seat. Eric Eric Friet going for his second WPT championship, but Justin's still looking for his first. Although he has several final tables. Can he finally take one home? These two players are also uh, playing for a bit of pride here. Whoever wins this tournament will have more in live tournament earnings than the other player. Eric coming into this final table with about 1.9 million in live earnings, and Justin coming in with about 1.8 in live tournament earnings. Justin, again, picking up a premium hand when his opponent has a less than premium hand. 8-7 offsuit, probably worth a call pre at least. And we will go to a flop. Justin, a big favorite. This is the type of hand you want your opponent to have when you have nines. Two yeah, cars so if you just want Justin you to have. run well, you want to see a flop somewhat like this. You want Eric to definitely make a pair. You know, Justin runs poorly when this is a jack 2-2 two, two flop. Just this, the fact that he's picked up a pair, is going to help him get some value here and not just get that instant fold on the flop. He's definitely going to get at least one street here. Eric with the very fast call. King on the turn. That may slow both players down here. Justin, Justin looks like he's going to try to value that pretty thinly here. It may work out for him. Nope. Yeah, that's a, that's a good bet by Justin there. I think I think I'd like to see a check at some point, whether it be the flop or the turn. You know, I mean, we see Eric. Well, he's surely going to check River if he gets called on turn. Well, yeah, we see Eric just fold the seven. I mean, you know, Eric is the type that might even bet like a, a weak pair on the river if if Justin does check the turn. Um, so I'd rather give myself a, a few more ways to get chips from Eric than just having him call the turn. See both these players guaranteed four hundred and thirty four thousand dollars. Playing for that six fifty first place. Great turnout here at the Brigada this this winter. Yeah, very nice turnout. Over a thousand players in this event. Over twelve hundred players. Eric's Eric just limping in with the queen suited. Justin content to take the free flop here, I think. King two nine, no help for anybody. Eric is in the lead with queen high. There's the seven. Eric's going to start betting on the turn now. I, I don't hate this bet. Um, you know, his queen high is not super likely to be good. I showed down here. It's a pretty weak queen high, too. 
So starting to just deny some equity, get some folds, uh, seems to be okay here. Three on the river doesn't change anything. So we'll see if Eric follows through on the bluff. He does not, and Justin is in a win. Justin picking up some steam now. Sweet. The problem with betting there is if you're not folding out a seven, you're only trying to fold out ace high end at two. So maybe well, you're better you're off still, just trying to check it. Out. You still deny some equity. I mean, I, I'm not entirely sure what his, you know, whole limping range, you know, that gets the turn might look like. But um, most of the time on the on the turn there, taking some of those single high card hands and starting to bluff with them is, is not a terrible idea. Uh, you can make the argument that he should use more, you know, jack highs or uh, lower, you know, connected cards that they didn't bet the flop, like six fives or something like that. But um, I, I think right. one bet with some of those hands is not the end of the world. Especially against a you know an opponent who may seem to be giving up a lot when he checks. Justin gonna raise ace three. Eric will quickly fold the nine two, and Justin patting his lead again here. Tables can turn very quickly. I will say that with the way these two players are playing, I don't think we're gonna see a a match where one person slowly grinds down the other. I really think we're going to see a big confrontation at some point where, you know, they, they play a big 20 or 30 big blind pot and, and that kind of swings the, the match one way or the other. Eric will tank raise, raise from Eric. Queen two. And Justin with a very playable hand here. Nine eight suited. And both players swap a pair. Justin also has some back doors. Yeah, both players are going to enjoy this flop. Heads up, most of the time, any pair is going to be usually puts you in the lead. Unfortunately for Justin, he has run into the top pair of Eric. A pretty small bet from Eric. Justin with a fairly robust hand here. What do you mean by what do you mean by that? This like the nine eight of hearts means he's going to like a lot of turns as opposed to having a hand like a nine, four offsuit or something. So even though they're both second pair, uh, he still has a lot more options on different turns, even if they're not the clearest good turns for him, like things like a, the 10 of hearts or something like that, that he's going to have, you know, maybe a little scary to a lot of other second pairs. He still has a continue on. Is, is that correct? Right, right. Eric picks up two pair on the turn now. Justin drawing quite thin, but the sizing is pretty small. So we may see another call here. Now his eight of hearts becomes a bit of a liability as he's actually blocking a lot of the hands that Eric would be uh, two barreling as a bluff. 10-8, 7-8. Eight, eight. Maybe jack-8. Eight. Do you think that matters less since we've seen Eric be a little more sporadic with his bluff choices? You know, we've yes, I do think that matters less against Eric than it would against most players. Betting a lot of hands, like just for example, maybe a king four type hand that he just bets twice. We've even seen him choose some, you know, bottom pairs or or second pairs to bet twice with sometimes. Yeah, Eric's Eric's range construction is definitely a lot more nebulous than uh, most players. I think so. Yeah, for Ju for Justin, he kind of has to go to level zero and just be like, yeah, I have like second pair. It's a pretty good hand here, and it's a small bet. I'm just gonna call again. This is getting now stinky. riverbed of two million. Justin in a tough spot here. A lot of stuff missed. The backdoor clubs did get there. He has to wonder how many value bets Eric really has here. Like, is he going to be value betting a hand like Queen Five, for instance? Looks like he's that's two million in his hand there. He does make the call. He makes the call. Pretty tough spot for Justin there. Seems like he knew his fate. I can certainly see why he called down. It's a very difficult spot for him. Seems like he knew his fate before he tossed it in. 
Eric, once again, yeah, that's over okay sometimes. In that spot, you have to be good. Uh, one time in three. So you can you can suspect that you're beat and still have a correct call. And we're back to uh, close to even here. Eric with a slight lead. Justin raising the queen two. Eric with the jack nine. Eric with a much more playable hand here. I think this is part of what makes heads up so interesting. That even though Justin technically has the best hand in his queen high, it's much easier for Eric to play a hand like jack nine because of all the you know uh, aggression he can use when he makes some draws and stuff like that. But Justin will certainly like the queen high flop. Yeah, it's a spot where Justin has the raw equity advantage pre by a very small amount, but you'd rather be playing Eric's hand realistically in most scenarios. Justin is going to bet the flop here. Eric, uh, a decent float candidate. He's got... Oh, he's going to go for a check. Is that a raise? Yeah, those, raise. Are not, those are not calling chips. 1.5 from Eric. Justin now with a weak top pair. The weakest top pair, but. Yeah, Justin won't be going anywhere here on the flop. Certainly will be calling the flop, and we'll see what happens on the turn here. Turn is a four. No help for Eric. It does help some of his uh, low straight draw type stuff. This is a nice example of what you were saying, though, against Eric. It's hard to uh, pin down exactly what his bluffing range is. He's going to choose a lot of just kind of random hands like this. Now, Eric thinking about firing again. The second time we've seen him use a time chip before bluffing. He did that earlier as well. I actually kind of like it in these spots. I'm not sure I would be looking too much into that if I was Justin, but you know that he doesn't have a clear bet here. He is bluffing. Drawing completely dead. Wow. Two million. Eric here, two million on the turn to Justin. And Justin with a top pair, but he is in a bit of an awkward spot in that he can't really improve. Now, it is a pretty small bet here. But so far in this heads-up match, we've seen just Justin calling down and being shown bad news by Eric. So I wonder if that's going to really influence him to want to fold here on the turn. I think, I think Eric can have to too many hands like 7-6 or something that are still going to be... Uh, you know, sort of semi-bluffing here for Justin to want to fold. If Eric bets again on the river, it could get very tough, though. Eight on the river. Should mostly be a blank here. You know, if we think Eric yeah, might shouldn't have a, really, shouldn't have really have either player. seven, six, or an eight, seven type hand, then, then obviously he, he might make some two pairs, but... If Eric wishing. fires a big bet here, it is going to be pretty tough for Justin. I mean, he's only beating a pure bluff. And it's not super easy to put your opponent on a pure bluff in this type of spot. Eric gives up. Justin quickly checks. Justin and we'll will see. immediately check back and be very see, happy to win. Very nice hand by Justin. Justin Zaki is back on top here this heads up match. Eric uh, put the pressure on the turn, but... And I think on that turn, too, Justin's going to have a lot of hands like 7-6, 7-5, 4-5, 3-5, all that sort of stuff with the pair and the gut shot that if Eric is going to try to bluff through the turn, I think he should be bluffing the river as well. Yeah, I think that you, you, you're you letting Justin just see showdown too cheaply there. I mean, you see he had a pretty good hand in his top pair, and that would have been a really tough call if Eric bombs the river.
Eric's just going to limp in with the jack three. I guess he got the Trust memo that nine, six. it should be a playable hand. Eric ahead with the three here. Justin, not going to continue with that one. So Eric with 40 big blinds to so the 53 big blinds of Justin. We've seen some back and forth in this heads-up match. But the battle continues. Two interesting hands here. Always, always interesting to see how it plays out when players' cards are so closely connected to each other. Justin continuing with the raising strategy. Eric going to make the call. And Justin, nice flop for him. Top pair and his six interacts nicely with the lower end of this board. He will take that one down. Justin opening up close to a, a one and a half to one lead here. Which one of these players do you think is more experienced, shorthanded, and heads up? I would say that Justin. I would guess Justin, but uh, it's probably played. Eric more has hands. certainly been in these final table spots very often, so. Just being a professional, I'm assuming that Justin has played more hands of heads up. That, that's a reasonable assumption to make, I think. If he's playing mostly tournaments. Even if Eric has more tough. of these uh, big WPT final tables, Justin is certainly final tabled more than his fair share of you know, yeah. smaller tournaments. Well, so far, I think that uh, Justin has been playing pretty well heads up. There's nothing that he's really done to indicate to me that he, he lacks experience. Of course, up. yeah. Yeah, except, I agree. For, except for maybe folding the 10-5 on the, on the button. We'll see what he does here with 5-4 off. He's going to limp, which he hasn't really been doing. He's mostly been raising. Yeah, I, I don't. I'm not I in love with that. I kind of prefer sticking with the all-raise strategy. But if you, if you are going to, uh, you know, sort of carve out a limp range for yourself, you just have to make sure you balance it and make sure there's a few strong hands in there. I don't think you need to really balance it if you're not worried about Eric really, you know, pouncing on that. If you're just going to limp some hands to try to see some cheap flops and he's never going to, you know, put any pressure on you, then that, that's fine. We haven't seen him really put a ton of pressure on him yet over the limp. Isn't this his first limp heads up, Justin? Mm, he's. I think he limped once earlier on the ma uh, right as the match started. Okay. So both players with a gut shot here. Eric with a slightly better gut shot. Eric actually Eric up and down. Yeah. Has position. An eight or a four will give Eric a straight. I wouldn't mind seeing oh, a raise from right. Justin at some point, whether it be the flop or the turn. He's got a very weak straight draw. And five high is just not going to not going to win the pot very often. Yeah, I, I, I think that if Justin is folding 5-4 there, then uh, he can't really r raise on the turn. Like, I'm not sure what hands he would be uh, raising on a bluff if not 5-4. Yeah. Um, having said that, uh, you know, it's dicey to raise the turn when your opponent leads into you twice on that board. However, your opponent very well could have a lot of gut shots himself. 
Barrick with 10-7 here. Going back to raising, it looks like. Justin hasn't beat with the queen nine. So heads up to the flop we go. King six four rainbow. Eric is going to stick with these small bets. And this is a somewhat difficult float for Justin. He does have queen high, which is okay. But not a whole lot else going on for him, and he will make the fold there. Yeah, tough to do a whole lot there. I don't hate calling, but you're just going to run into too many like ace high type hands too. Especially since of how frequently Eric's just been betting. That I think the folding is pretty reasonable. I think queen nine and... Or I'm sorry, queen jack is definitely a call. Maybe queen ten. Yeah, I think they're all like pretty close. Uh, queen jack obviously better. But even that's not a slam dunk. Justin with the king four here, but Eric with ace jack, a nice one. So pretty noteworthy here, Eric, just calling with the ace jack. Yeah, I, I think that that's a mistake. I think in general, um, both of these players have been three betting less than they should. Yeah, I'd agree with that. Yeah, I mean, if you're not three betting a hand as strong as ace jack pre flop, you're just letting your opponents realize a lot of equity with all of their weak hands. And Justin does turn the king. Got a cheap flop and a free turn, and now he's got a king. Eric with a uh, gut shot. Eric's spot here is, is kind of tough. You don't want to allow your opponent to, to realize equity by checking, but you know, it, it's a, it's a easy check call candidate, but at the same time, leading seems to have some merit here. Um, maybe you want to be able to bluff if a heart hits the river. So I, I, I'm always kind of confused when I'm in Eric's spot here with a, with ace jack on this type of board. Yeah, it is. It is a difficult hand to play for sure. I think he gets a tough, tough opponent. It's it's just going to be in a check. So Eric, unless he bluffs here, he is not going to win the hand. But a lot of stuff got there, so he might try to bluff. Yeah, that that's a pretty good card for him overall. I'd imagine he'd be betting a lot of eight to nine on the turn with the gutter. Well, he, he does up. check. And I assume Justin will quickly check here unless he's going to go for one of his super thin value bets. He does check and take it down. Yeah, I think by the river, Ace Jack is actually one of the weaker hands Eric's going to reach the river with, so he should probably be bluffing with it, right? Yeah, the only thing that makes it less of a bluff is the fact that it does he does have a heart in his hand. Um but yeah, yeah I, true. I, I absolutely agree. I, I think that uh, Jack Queen obviously is is the more obvious bluff hand there. But I think right. after Jack Queen, Ace Jack is the next best hand to bluff with. So I would have liked to see Eric uh, bluff at that pot. So Justin pads his lead a little bit more now. He truly has a one and a half to one lead. A shame we're missing out on the table banter here. Like they're having some lively conversations about something or another. Yeah, they, they went at it a little bit earlier. It seemed they were, you know, nothing, nothing serious, but they were, they were, kind of needling each other a little bit about the, uh, the way, the way a hand was played. I think so. It seems like they've, being are being a little more friendly now. But it was a, it was good, good competitive t chat. I'll say. So Eric with Jack six, gonna just limp in. Justin will check.
I don't know if that helps Justin, but it doesn't help Eric. Based on the hands that these players have been limping, I wouldn't expect there to be too many kings in Eric's limping range. No, probably, probably Worth noting that Justin checked back threes pre, which I think is actually totally correct. It's uh, not a hand you really want to be inflating the pot with out of position, even though you're going to be ahead very, very often. And now on this board, a great board for threes, Justin will bet. Wish I knew what they were saying to each other. I know, Sam. One of the few times the table audio would be relevant. And Justin going to take that one down. Blinds are going up to 250 and 5. I think the blind level's got to 30 minutes once you get heads up. So, with so Justin the with 45 big blinds, Eric with 29 now. Well, right. With the blinds going up, Eric now under 30 big blinds. Is he at a stack, Mike, where facing an open, he can just shove all in? Or should he be shorter before he starts to do that with you 20? Can, if if your opponent's opening a lot, you definitely can shove hands. Um, there, there's definitely a little bit of, of debate over what's the, you know, the best play. So... Some of the classic hands you see people do this with are usually the smallest pocket pairs. You know, you take a hand like pocket twos that if you just run the equity, it has a pretty good hand. It's a pair. Pairs are tough to make, heads up. Um, but when you go to every flop, like nearly every flop except for one with a two in it, is not going to be a good flop for you. So it's really tough to play post flops so when you only have 30 big blinds. You don't mind just taking it down pre. And hey, if your opponent calls, probably base king and ace queen a lot. So you just get to flip. Um, you know, so hands like that are the ones I think you see the most. Uh, there's still definitely debate among players over if that's necessary because 30 big blinds is still a lot of chips and you still have plenty of play with that sort of stack. So uh, I I usually only do that if I have an opponent who's opening really a lot. Otherwise, I would I would probably just opt to, you know, wait till my stack is a little shorter before I start shoving. So in heads up poker, you do want to defend your big blind liberally. I would say that this is a little bit too liberal of a defend here. The 5-3 offsuit by Eric in the big blind. This is one of the worst hands you can have heads up. Yeah, 5-3 off's a little, a little rough here. Justin going to win with ace high. Eric could have bluffed the river there. Yeah, I think you're going to reach that river with 5 high. you got to at least consider bluffing. Yeah, I, yeah. Would, I wouldn't mind the bluff there. And now it'll be interesting, uh, Justin min raised that hand. It'll be interesting to see once he sees Eric defend the 5-3 off, if he, he might choose to increase his raise size to maybe 2.5x. Yeah, it's honestly probably not a, a ridiculously bad call with 5-3 with off. It's probably pretty close, actually. There's some yeah, I think there. for the minimum it's fine. I think if Justin goes any bigger than the minimum, you have to start folding 5-3. I would be surprised if it's the right call. The more your opponent's letting you see turns and rivers, the more you can get away with that stuff, too. Sure. Nice shot of the championship trophy in the background. These two players look to get their name on it. Eric looking to get his name on it again. So how full is that WPT trophy? It's very full. Um, I, I actually don't know what they do. Uh, there's a little bit of space near the bottom, I think, or on the side. I was looking at it the other day. Uh, so multiple winners get – they have a little plaque with your you know, your name, the tournament you won, and then the, your whole cards that you won the tournament with. If you win a second WPT, you get a little diamond added to your, your plaque. So you, it's nice to look at the trophy and find you know the, the guys who've won three and four WPTs. So Eric looking to add that diamond – um, so WPT has a sweat here too. They're hoping for Eric to win so they don't need to buy a new plaque. Yeah, probably. <laughs> yeah.
it's fun looking at next next time it's uh next time you see it out there take a look looking at all the old WPTs and all the old names that won. Justin a three bet here with the nines and that should end the hand. They charge him a time. Yeah, I think chip he for took that. a little too long, yeah. He's got a two to one lead now. Up to nearly twenty five million. Eyeing that prize. Sixteen cash. This is his seventeenth cash, his second final table. A lot of career earnings for only one final table. Those are just WPT earnings. Yeah, I'm looking to looking to nearly double those with the win today. 